So today we're really excited to have Dr. Lisa Pasquale here. She is a professor of rehabilitation in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Um, she went to UC Berkeley for undergrad. She then went to UC Davis for her MD and stayed there for her physical medicine and rehab residency training. And she's now with us at UC San Francisco. Um, and if any of you, I guess, are thinking of doing any sort of elective in PM&R or a sub I or anything, you will probably interface with her as she sort of heads sort of the educational side too. Um, and is just a really great lecturer. So we're really excited to have her. Um, and today, the title of her talk is Rehabilitation of the Limb Loss Patient. Um, so thanks again, Dr. Pasquale, for being here. You're welcome. Thanks everybody for having me. This is really exciting because I know that the, uh, the people that are here today are especially interested in PM&R. So um, that makes it uh, all the more exciting. So um, for those of, uh, for, for, I guess we could share screen, right? Uh, oh, hold on a second. If you have any questions for me, um, uh, over the uh, course of the lecture, please feel free to stop me or, uh, cause I won't necessarily be looking at chat cause I, um, I can't do the, I can't do both at the same time and get distracted. So just shout out and say, hey, I have a question. Um, we're just gonna go through um, as much as uh, we can. I may skip over things that might be um, uh, to get to get to some other potentially more interesting things. And if you guys have, like I said, if you have questions, just let me know. Um, so just a little bit of overview in terms of um, limb loss. Um, we're just, uh, in, ter in terms of what we're gonna be looking at for limb loss, we're gonna be looking at a little bit about vascular causes, traumatic causes, some prevention, um, what we do in rehab, and then um, just kind of like, we're gonna do a case and, and uh and give you an idea of what we're doing. And for some of you who have rotated with me or spent time with me, some of the, uh, the case might look familiar. Some of the uh, terminology might be familiar. Um, so that'd be good if you just say, hey, that looks familiar. Um, so hopefully you'll remember some of that stuff. Okay, so just in terms of statistics, and I have not seen more recent statistics on this. Um, I haven't looked in the last year. But suffice it to say that limb loss is a very costly um, uh, disability um, for both hospital costs and, uh, and also outpatient costs for the actual uh, therapy and for the limbs and, and the amount of work time lost, things like that, very expensive. And here's just kind of the breakdown between uh, whether it's due to a vascular disease or to trauma the vast majority is vascular disease. And if you rotate with me uh, on the functional limb service, which I'll be um, talking about soon, most of our patients are vascular patients, but coming in a close second is trauma. And just a little bit about peripheral vascular disease. Um, it's, it's a circulation disorder, as you know, um, and peripheral artery disease is quite common affecting uh, blood flow to the arms and legs. Um, it affects a lot of Americans, peripheral artery disease, 50% um, of, of which are symptomatic. And the most severe manifestation really is um, limb loss and potentially risk of mortality. Okay, um, peripheral vascular disease can sometimes present as painful cramping, achiness, fatigue of the limb with ambulation and burning pain. Um, you also hear potentially of claudication, which is sort of like when you start to walk, as the more you walk, the more painful it becomes, then you rest and then it feels better. So that's a, ter uh, a term that you'll be uh, hearing uh, if you have not already heard of this in the future. Okay, risk factors. There are some modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. These risk factors we can't really change. We can't really change our age um, or what our family history is. But these are some of the modifiable uh, uh, risk factors and this should extend down as far, my box should go down and include high blood pressure. But things that are potentially modifiable as our risk for heart disease or stroke, which is of course related to smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, obesity, and those kinds of things. 
Um, and it's usually, when we see somebody in our functional limb service clinic, it's usually an infection related to diabetes. And uh, in diabetes, you have problems with blood flow to the small vessels. Um, you have an increased risk of peripheral artery disease. And then for, pe for people who may have these risks, they can also have neuropathy. So they can't necessarily feel what's happening uh, to their lower extremities. Um, uh, if they happen to step on a piece of glass or something is in their shoe and they're constantly walking on it, they may not perceive that. And then that can result in skin breakdown and subsequent infection. And of course, once you get that infection that puts you at risk uh, for amputation. Um, in di uh, for somebody with diabetes, they have a much higher risk of amputation uh, than the general population. So what can you do about this? Is there anything we can do in terms of prevention? And um, in Europe, they did a number of studies to take a look at, um, could they prevent um, the incidence of major amputation uh, by, by taking it um, as a group kind of a uh, group endeavor? If you can imagine if you're a primary care doctor and uh, you have a diabetic patient, it's really hard to manage everything about that patient uh, in addition to their diabetes, in other words, their footwear, um, are they see their actual um, nail care or their skin inspection or all of these different things or, that might need to take place to prevent um, um, an amputation. So they developed, uh, many countries uh, developed interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary clinics or multidisciplinary clinics to try to figure out um, how to prevent these, taking it from different angles, like a nutritionist or an infectious disease person, and there's the primary care doctor. And in this case, um, they had a vascular person, the primary care doctor, um, they had uh, somebody looking in from infectious disease, and they actually decreased their rate of amputation uh, by 62%. So you're wondering, could, is that really something that that can happen um, in another clinic setting? Was that just serendipitous and it all came together with this group? Well, they actually found that in Sweden, they did something similar. They had a different, slightly different makeup in their interdisciplinary team, um, but using their team approach as to, for inspecting the feet, uh, making sure diabetes was in control, things like that, they also approached 60% decrease in their, um, in their amputation rate uh, as well. So it was something that was reproducible. And then further in Spain, they did also something similar. They had an endocrinologist, so somebody to look at diabetes. They had a surgeon, they had rehab, rehab involved, a nutritionist and nursing, and they also were able to uh, pretend, uh, re reduce the, um, the incidence of amputation. So for us, what does that mean? So whatever we can do from the, the, from the realm of the primary care person, if we can partner with podiatry, with maybe vascular, with nursing, to see if we can try to prevent what starts um, as a potential risk for an amputation uh, in our just vascular patients, primarily our diabetics, it would be worth it um, to, to try to do that. Now, of course, um, when you put a whole bunch of teams together, like a team like that together, it can be resource intensive. But if you can imagine um, sort of like the payback for that or the risk, what is that, the ROI, the return on investment uh, is, is high for something like this. So you can potentially prevent the incidence of, of uh, amputation uh, by sort of attacking its uh, cause from different uh, perspectives. Okay, the other um, uh, uh, cause of amputation is trauma, which we definitely see here at the general. Um, the most common uh, cause is a motor vehicle crash for upper extremity and a motorcycle crash or pedestrian versus otter for lower extremity amputations. Tends to be male, young males. If you, if you do rehab, uh, and somebody asks you, who's at more risk, males or females, young males or older males, almost universally, if you're talking about amputation, if you're talking about spinal cord injury, if you're talking about traumatic brain injury, it's gonna be young males um, are the most at risk. 
And the most common level is um, a transtibial amputation, which we more commonly call a below the knee amputation. Let me stop here for a second and see if anybody has any questions or comments. Okie dokes. The importance about limb loss, whether it be due to vascular uh, uh, causes or due to traumatic causes, is that its prevalence is anticipated to double by the year 2050, which is huge. So for example, if you have about 700,000 people with uh, limb loss or amputations, it's gonna be 1.3 million-ish people by 2050. And remember the, how much it costs now for somebody who has had an amputation. Well, if you can imagine those costs in the future. One of the things for those of you who are interested in going into PM&R um, that is really important that we really excel at, I think, is teamwork. Um, interdisciplinary teams or multidisciplinary teams kind of um, are more common now than they were in the future. But in PM&R, we've been doing that really for years. And uh, this is a model that is at the VA and at many other hospitals where they uh, integrate um, PM&R with medicine, with general surgery and uh, ortho and other services to try to better manage individuals who have had, um, particularly if it's the VA, traumatic amputations that, affect, that are affected by multiple um, systems and thus require the expertise of multiple discipline, dis disciplines. So, um, PM&R is an integral part um, of this and often is the coordinating uh, clinic uh, for these types of services. So it really takes a village to, um, to take care of some of these challenging patients, whether they're traumatic or vascular, um, because they are, especially in our system, because we are a safety net hospital, not only do they have um, medical issues related to the actual amputation itself, but they also yeah. have um, issues related to, um, they also have issues related to um, uh, their psycho psychosocial status, which may be other uh, comorbidities, or they may have um, psychosocial challenges, which are uh, more unusual to the general population. So that makes it a little bit more difficult. So what we did uh, at the general is we developed the functional limb service and got together a whole bunch of people um, uh, to try to talk about what is needed to take care of these patients who often um, are lost to follow up or who have difficulty coming into the hospital. So we actually um, pulled all these people together, these variety of people together and asked them uh, what, what do they think was gonna be the most helpful. Um, so the goals were first prevention, we wanted to use, uh, utilize the team to max, maximize functional outcomes. And we wanted to provide patients with, and their caregivers with education um, so that they would be more informed about their um, recovery and be involved in their decision-making. Um, what we do on the service, for those of you who have, has anybody worked with me, had come to an FLS clinic? Just shout out if you have, I can't I remember. have Casey here. Hey, Casey, yes. Hey, Casey did. Um, but what we do on the FLS service is we review clinical cases. Um, we are available to, to provide inpatient consultation. If somebody is going to have an amputation and they wonder what level uh, might be recommended uh, uh, as it might impact um, uh, functional status. Um, we also see them as outpatient. We have a peer mentor and, and support group uh, for patients. Um, we just started our first virtual group um, just a couple of weeks ago um, after a, hi a hiatus due to COVID. And we're constantly looking for improvements in um, our, our service as well. And for those of you who have the time, if you, I don't even know the, um, the web address, but if you Google UCSF amputee video tutorial, something like that, you'll see the video tutorials that we produced um, uh, with a grant from the San Francisco General Hospital Foundation um, that goes over um, amputations, troubleshooting, um, troubleshooting the whole rehab process, the whole fabrication process, for those of you who might be interested. And we actually really like it because it um, highlights some of our own patients here. 
um, which I think is important. So it doesn't look like a fully professional um, production where uh, it may it may not resonate with some of our of our population. Okay. So um, before surgery, um, usually what happens, um, they have a clinic visit. And um, this is, if, of course, if it's not a traumatic amputation and they're admitted to the hospital. If they're admitted to the hospital, we can be, they can be seen by us um, to um, assess uh, if we're able to, um, if they ask us whether the amputation level should be, for example, a through knee amputation or an above knee amputation. What are the functional considerations about both? Uh, we're available to um, provide them with information about that. And after surgery, um, we are also available to make recommendations as to whether or not we think they can go into um, one of these, which is a post-op rigid dressing or whether or not they're a candidate for it. Some people aren't, most people aren't in our system, but it may, if they are, then this may hasten their ability to move on to prosthetic ambulation. Um, this, is, uh, this is what after this, which is a post-op bridge addressing, where it's kind of like they cast the, uh, cast the patient after amputation, and it results in something that looks kind of like this, which is where we put a pylon on it. Um, they're not really supposed to weight bear a whole lot on the pylon. So these are, potentially for people who are um, more agile, who are really good at paying, um, uh, following instructions um, and who are really reliable in terms of follow-up. Um, just based on that, that's, that's not very many of our patients unless they're very young patients. Um, but um, this is actually a possibility for patients that we may or may not recommend. Um, certainly when they come to rehab, there are certain, uh, when they're uh, after surgery, we recommend certain things about bed positioning. In other words, we don't want to put, uh, if they are a baloney amputee, we don't want to put pillows under the knee because that would then bend the knee and then put them at risk for knee flexion contractures. We also encourage them to lie on their stomach to basically stretch out their hip flexors because you know how in hospital beds, where when somebody is lying down, they often have the bed elevated and the knee elevated. So they look kind of like they're sitting in a chair. If they're that way for a long time, and that puts them at risk for a hip flexion contracture or a knee flexion contracture. <clears throat> Here's one of the ways to um, prevent that hip flexion contracture. You can see here that um, by lying on, on your stomach, you can really stretch out these hip flexors and allows them to do exercises this way. A lot of our patients can't really tolerate being on their stomach. So if they can't do that, then we recommend that they perform these exercises on their side. The other thing that we do is when they're in a wheelchair, we try to, uh, try to keep the knee extended. And um, we do that via a, um, a, uh, a limb protector and by keeping the leg elevated. Because a lot of there are times, and it's not unusual, where we have patients who are sitting in wheelchairs for long per, prolonged periods of time, and then now because their knee is bent and, as well as their hip, they develop both hip and knee flexion contractures just by being in the wheelchair. The problem with that is is that here's here's a gentleman who was a baloney amputee bilateral, so bilateral baloney amputee, and he was in his wheelchair all the time. Um, and did not perform range of motion. He developed knee flexion contractures. And the problems with, uh, with, with uh, knee flexion contractures is we cannot adequately fit somebody into a prosthesis when they have a knee flexion contracture um, because of the way the knee is bent. So we can't really fit them. So we have to get them out to at least negative 20 degrees, which is like, if this is zero with the leg totally straight, we have to get them to at least negative 20. So this is more than that. Um, uh, so what we did in his case is we did what's called serial casting, which is where we cast the limb and then we, we stretch the limb, cast it in a stretch, stretched position. And then we bivalve it. I don't know if I have, I don't think I have a picture of the bi, oh yeah, I do. Wait for it. Okay. Then we bivalve it this way. 
in that, whoops. In this way, when I do this, it seems to want to advance. Okay, uh, we cut it in half so that this allows us and the patient and the nursing staff to open it up and make sure the skin's okay. And then just uh, wind it back up and close it down again. So this allows us a way to do skin care, skin check, hygiene, uh, at the same time to stretch the limb. So then we do this again and again, basically. So he came back another two weeks later, had the cast, cast taken off. We stretched it some more, we cast it again and we bivalved it. And with the goal of trying to get it as straight as possible. So we basically ended up like this, um, which showed him to be much straighter and at this point, he was able to be um, fit for a prosthesis. So um, this took a lot of time to do. It was uncomfortable for the patient, I'm sure. Um, it's, it's resource and labor intensive. So the goal here is not to even have to go through this, but to educate the patient and their caregivers about avoiding the devel development of contractures at both the knee and the hip. Okay, here's the other thing about wound care. Here's kind of a typical look of what an, uh, a below knee amputee uh, wound site or even an above knee amputee wound site might look like. We wanna make sure that the, uh, this area is clean and dry. You see a little bit of uh, blood, bloody drainage from here. It's scant, it's an area to keep uh, a close watch on, but uh, uh, may be okay. We try to teach the patients to monitor their, their wound sites via a mirror um, and to also massage it. So we found that to prevent um, onset of um, phantom limb sensation or phantom mm -hmm. limb pain, which is kind of neurogenic pain um, that occurs, which makes the patient feel like their toe is there. And, it, and if it's phantom limb pain, it, it may feel like their toe is actually aching or itching or something like that. It's important that they um, massage gently their, uh, their limb to give their brain some feedback that this is where my limb ends. And um, uh, this may mitigate the development of uh, uh, phantom limb sensation or phantom limb pain. Okay, and here is when... What's that? Anybody have a question? Uh, okay. Was We've got, is it Zach here? I thought we would get more because it was like. Okay. Zach, do you have your, um? thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, here's, here's what we do for post-operative care. When the wound looks like it's pretty stable. It can still have the sutures in, but when it looks pretty stable, we, um, we don a, um, a shrinker sock, which basically begins the forming of, um, or reshaping of the limb. And it helps to mobilize the edema at the uh, distal end of the limb. And this is what it looks like for a baloney amputee. This is what it looks like for somebody who's above, uh, the, above the knee. And here's a limb protector. This is something that we, we put on after the sock and it helps to keep the limb straight and also provides padding and protection in case they <laughs> fall or in case they bump it against something. Okay, uh, so we like to start physical therapy as soon as possible to work on bed mobility and transfers to make sure their range of motion is good and to provide them with strengthening uh, activities uh, as well. Then they can begin pre-gate activities and that could be just sit to stand with a walker, for example, or sit to stand with crutches. OT can begin to work with activities of daily living, which is uh, basically putting your clothes on, taking your clothes off, getting on and off the toilet, uh, doing bathing activities, uh, moving about in bed, and also assessing what type of equipment that they may need, uh, the wheelchair, a bath chair, a tub bench, um, a commode, those kinds of things. And then um, while on rehab, they're working on such things as transferring in and out of their wheelchair, um, maybe standing with the front wheel walker, ideally to move towards household level distances and beginning to navigate stairs. This is not, uh, this is because you don't get a prosthesis right, right away. 
um, after a uh, amputation. We'll be seeing why in just a second. And ideally we get folks home doing, uh, doing things independently at either a wheelchair level or with use of a walker. Here. Um, so here, here's where they are following us up in clinic and they can have sutures intact. We remove our, um, our sutures and, and replace them with steri strips at about the three to four week point. Uh, as I said before, it's important to massage at the suture line and we're using this shrinker sock because here you can see how post-op they, they tend to be bulbous um, after, an injury, after the surgery. And as they use their shrinker sock, of course, this isn't the same person's leg, the, the limb starts to taper. And eventually, because of both atrophy and mobilization of the um, edema, you start to ideally get more of a conical shape over the course of, the, um, of um, shrinker sock use. And it's important to get towards this conical shape before you fit somebody for a prosthesis, because once you're using a prosthesis, Use of that prosthesis is gonna mobilize even more um, uh, leftover edema. And before you know it, if you haven't mobilized as much edema as possible from the get-go, suddenly you're gonna be, uh, you mobilize so much edema that now your socket doesn't fit. In other words, your socket, your, your limb is shrunk down uh, a lot. And now the socket is no longer adequately fitting and you're gonna be due for a new socket. So we try to mobilize as much as possible all of the swelling and all of the edema from the limb before we even fabricate the final socket. Dr. Pasquale? Yes. Hey, Ted. When you, when you mention mobilizing uh, the edema, uh, I guess where are you, I'm assuming getting swelling out of the, like, that short, shortened knee, but where are you mobilizing this edema to? To the lymphatic uh, system above the knee. So if you had your limb intact, um, your muscles would be mobilizing lymph fluid, stuff like that, um, just by virtue of walking and your muscles kind of squeezing in that area. Um, and now without that sort of walking movement and many of the people having their leg, what we call dependent or just hanging down, there's nothing to mobilize that lymph fluid and residual, uh, potentially residual edema from the surgery up back into the lymphatic system and back up uh, into the proximal leg into the rest of the body. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, let's see. Now, does every get, everybody get a prosthesis? Not everybody. And this, and this is why. When you consider, let's look at something more typical. So if somebody has a one-sided or a unilateral baloney amputation, there, the energy that's required to ambulate, it can be increased any for anywhere from nine, uh, to basically 10 to 30%. And um, there, um, have you guys ever heard of METs? Metabolic equivalence of energy? Sometimes it relates to cardiac rehab. It basically relates to the amount of energy you have to expend to do a certain task. And we often see METs referred to when somebody's got cardiac issues because a lot of METs, a lot of people who have cardiac issues, maybe after an MI, they can't get their heart rate up to achieve those METs because of cardiac issues. We also use METs uh, in this context as well. So a normal gait is about three METs. So somebody who has a unilateral or one-sided baloney amputation um, has an, uh, a MET increase of about 0.3 to 0.8 for walking. Now let's look at somebody who has an amputation that is much more proximal. So if you go up even higher, let's say you have an above the knee amputation. Let's see, there it is. Look how much higher your metabolic equivalence uh, increase or your increase in energy cost increases anywhere from 40 to 65%. So if you're somebody who, for example, has um, coronary artery disease and may have CHF and may be on dialysis, they may not have the capacity to expend this much more energy with ambulation. So it's important to take a look at when you're trying to determine if somebody is a prosthetic candidate or not, what they were doing prior 
to their surgery? Were they ambulating? Were they ambulating just in the house or did, just, did they just take a few steps from their wheelchair to the bathroom? Were they community ambulators? Do they have any other comorbidities? Taking a look at that and then also looking at how much energy somebody is going to need to walk um, based on what their amputation level is and try to put that all together in a picture. And that's where I think for PMNR, we really excel in putting that picture together and helping people uh, determine who's a prosthetic candidate and who's not. Um, some of you, uh, Casey probably remembers this when we talk about K levels. Um, K levels don't really, K doesn't refer to anything that begins with a K. It's basically just a code. And these are Medicare codes. They pertain to what type of ambulator somebody um, somebody is, and what type of and based on that, what kind of components they may have in their prosthesis based on their K level. So basically, the easy way to look at this is somebody who is a K zero is somebody who is determined not to have the ability to really use an, a, a prosthesis. So they would qualify. They would not qualify to get a prosthesis in the first place. You can picture somebody like that would be somebody who was not even ambulatory prior, who may or may not have the ability to don and doff a prosthesis, who has cognitive issues with respect to that, things like that. Versus somebody, whoops, versus somebody, somebody who is a community ambulator who is walking in the community um, for, you know, walking in the mall, unlimited, pretty much unlimited distances who has uh, no other significant medical comorbidities, who's coordinated, who can uh, uh, follow directions, who's, who can reliably keep appointments, maybe somebody, they would be a K3. And if they're a K3, they would qualify for uh, much more sophisticated or uh, complex uh, prosthetic components. Whereas somebody who's a K1, who maybe just might be using a prosthesis to transfer because they can't really walk, they would just qualify for really basic components. So we take all of these things um, into consideration when we're thinking about whether somebody is a prosthetic candidate and if they are, what kind of a prosthetic candidate are they? Are they somebody who we think is gonna be doing running with it or is it somebody who we think just needs it to help transfer from one surface to another? So, so for transtibial am, uh, uh, amputation or a BKA, as we said before, their METS is about nine to 28% increase in their energy when they walk versus a hemipelvectomy. So somebody who has an amputation that basically resulted in removal of half of their pelvis and their full limb, um, for them to ambulate, their METS is 6.75. So 125% increase in energy expenditure. Basically 6.75 is akin to somebody jogging. So if somebody um, has a hemipelvectomy who was not ambulating a lot before or who has heart disease and CHF, their potential for ambulating with a hemipelvectomy prosthesis is probably on the poorer side, just based on the fact that if they were gonna walk, it would be akin to you or me uh, jogging. Okay, questions so far, anybody? Yeah, actually, Dr. Pasquale. Um, yeah, hi. My name is Keith Vernon, I'm hey, a first Keith. year uh, PT student. I'm curious, is, is there some way in which, in which candidates can change their uh, K levels, or is there some way they can say, okay, well, I'd like to improve to, to be able to meet this requirement or some such? That's an excellent question. I, I, I see you're a PT student. Yes, ma'am. Ah, because you are very key in this, in that there is something, I can't remember if I listed here, there is something, I think I do, is something called an AMP no pro test, which AMP no pro refers to doing the test with no prosthesis. So that tends to be somebody who's never had a prosthesis. There's also an AMP Pro version, which is um, the test being performed on, on somebody who has a prosthesis. And basically what the AMP No Pro and the AMP Pro does is it takes the patient through a variety of test maneuvers, basically sit to stand, stand on one leg, 
uh, reach over, bend over, walk down the hall, walk up some stairs, things like that. And it grades them, uh, gives them a score. And once they get that score, that actually correlates to um, the, the K levels. So somebody with a really low AMP no pro scale may correlate with a K0 or a K1, so poor prosthetic candidate. So that, first of all, gives us an idea of where somebody may fall in that whole K level spectrum. We do, I do have a guy, for example, who I saw last week who was a K2, so sort of like a short community ambulation guy when he got his prosthesis and now he is due for a new prosthesis, but he's been doing so well that when we retested him with the AMP no pro, he's now a K3. So, um, so there is the possibility to either go up on the K levels or to go down depending on how well somebody's doing or how their medical comorbidities may be impacting them. Does that make sense? Absolutely, thank you. Yep. And usually, the reason I say that is usually it's the PT who does the AMP no pro. So um, that's where we have, we have in our clinic, in our FLS clinic, we have a physical therapist who's with us um, who is following uh, our amputees. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking that through and I was wondering if, uh, if uh, and, I, and it sounds like there is, I was wondering if there was some uh, process or program in which they maybe assisted people in making those levels, so. Yes. Yes, yes. We actually, in our, um, in our functional limb service clinic, we have the prosthetist there, uh, the physical therapist there, and myself. And, um, and we kind of talk amongst ourselves and figure out what the K levels are uh, based on the testing and what the patient's been doing in real life functionally and try to come up with a decision um, based on that. Okay, just some uh, quickly, let's see where we are. Um, Amputation types. So here is a toe amputation. We're gonna just focus mostly on lower extremity amputations. For these type of patients, we really don't um, uh, need to do a prosthesis for that. And remember prosthesis means replacement of something. And here would be, it's not a great picture because it's kind of fuzzy. Um, here's an example of what a toe prosthesis would be because it just basically fills in the blank of a missing toe. Um, it's not necessary that somebody has that because the one toe doesn't necessarily significantly impact their gait, but it's a possibility if they need it. This is a ray amputation. You can kind of see what a ray did. It takes off the digit as well as the metatarsal. And sometimes when you have more than one ray, you may need a prosthesis. If you just have one, you may or may not need one. Okay. This is a transmetatarsal amputation. So basically it goes right across the metatarsals here. In these cases, sometimes people prefer, whoa, if I just move my mouse, it's so sensitive. Sometimes people prefer um, using um, uh, nothing or just stuffing the empty area in their shoe with socks. And sometimes people actually have a formal transmetatarsal um, uh, prosthesis that they can use. More uncommon are sort of these midfoot amputations, which includes the Liz Frank and the show part. We really don't see a lot of those. They're not great amputations, uh, uh, mostly because it produces an imbalanced foot. So for folks, I guess, just see if anybody's out there want to give this, this a go. Um, why do you think that foot is imbalanced? Like what might be the, um, the problem with having an amputation like this based on what muscles, here's my hint, um, what muscles be, may still be intact and working in the foot? Anyone want to get, uh, make a guess? I know it's kind of like obscure. Well, if you can imagine, um, we do have our Achilles tendon intact. And that would be, I don't want to move the, when, and whenever I move this, it moves the slide forward. This is intact. So now we've got our plantar flexors intact, but what we really don't have intact are our dorsiflexors. So we have a foot that has a tendency to want to point downwards. And the problem with that is over time, that foot may indeed begin to point downwards. And that would make it difficult for not only fit, but if you can imagine if a foot's pointing downwards and this is pointing and pushing down, uh, downwards into the shoe, this puts this area at risk for um, pressure. 
pressure breakdown. Here are some of the prostheses potentially for um, these uh, uh, foot amputations. The next level is actually a Symes amputation, which is basically an amputation in this kind of plane like this, sort of transmalleolar. And it results in, ugh, this is like, okay. It results in a um, uh, amputation that looks a little bit bulbous at the end. Um, it looks a little bit strange and it can be um, not, well, here, here's the, um, here's the prosthesis, which is not that cosmetically pleasing. The advantage of this uh, amputation is that you have a long lever arm for ambulation. So you have good control of your leg. The kind of not great part about it is you have a prosthesis that um, is not as cosmetically pleasing as some other prostheses. And for the very dysvascular diabetics, these patients often move on to, an, to a baloney amputation in the end. Um, here's your baloney amputation, the most common amputation that we see. And here are some prostheses, um, the most basic to the, to the more fancy. And what determines basic and fancy is your K level. Here's, an, here's a through knee amputation, which basically is sort of disarticulation of the knee. They remove the whole tibia, um, but, what is, but what remains intact are their femoral condyles, which are actually, you can actually weight bear on those. Let me just backtrack. You cannot weight bear directly on the end of this limb because it's not made for that. Basically, it's just like a cut bone with some with plus or minus soft tissue there. But for here, you can weight bear directly on this because um, uh, the condyles are intact and they're smooth. Um, this is somebody who ha actually has, is this gonna work? Oh, hold on, wait for it. He has a, has a through knee amp uh, amp amputation. By the time we saw him, he's already kind of developed this hitch this hitch in his ambulation that we think we're not gonna be able to get rid of um, because he sort of um, developed that muscle memory to walk that way. Let me do that again. Oops. Here we go. You can see how he dips, he dips his uh, shoulder in that area and it almost looks like he's short on that side, but he actually isn't. So um, he's really functional though. He's working full time uh, and doing well, but uh, as perfectionist type of physical therapists and PM and R people, we like to have people's gait look good. And so uh, we, weren't, we weren't really able to get rid of that kind of dip that he does. Here's an above knee amputation and a, an above knee prosthesis. This is, they have a bunch of different type of socket styles that you can have as well. Here's a whole bunch of different socket styles. And here is somebody who might have a hip disarticulation or a hemipelvectomy. So here you have the hip joint, a knee joint. When you start getting something that high and you have to control both hip and knee, the energy expenditure for that is quite significant. Okay, we talked about this. Okay, really quickly so that I can leave a couple of minutes for questions. This is just a case um, of a gentleman who was in a high-speed MVA with a severe pelvic fracture. Unfortunately, he had a rectal tear so that the co rectal contents went into his soft tissues. Here, you don't really appreciate that, but you kind of see that there's this sort of red and full in this area. But this is what was underlying it um, because of the uh, spillage of the rectal contents. So you can see he had a lot of necrotic damage here. There's a lot of necrotic uh, tissue that remains. Um, by the time I saw him, this was already debrided out this was his, um, a, a drain that was kind of um, just tagging his sciatic nerve. Um, and that's the back of his acetabulum. Okay, so PM&R was called in to see what, uh, uh, to make recommendations regarding uh, whether or not, let me backtrack, he could, uh, they could do an above knee amputation or if they could maybe, or did they have to go up higher for amputation? So there's a lot of different things that we have to consider when we're looking at that. 
uh, we, there was a bunch of us in the room. One of the trauma surgeons who had just come back from Afghanistan said we should probably amputate because that's what they would have done. And uh, they would have done um, based on her experience in um, in the Middle East, um, and that way that they can just move on with rehabilitation. Um, the plastic surgeon was a little daunted because if you can imagine, there has to be something that covers up that huge soft tissue defect. And he noted that that would probably be the biggest graft that he'd ever done. And then orthopedic surgery was wondering if we did keep that, um, that leg, uh, he also had pelvic fractures as well. Could they stabilize the pelvis so he could actually walk on it? Really, my thoughts weren't so much about um, standing or walking in general. Mine was mostly, um, could, uh, we just need to have him something sit down on something. So I wasn't so concerned with walking as to his ability to have a good surface on his buttocks to sit on. Why is that? Um, I'm just gonna go skip this way. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, one of the things that we have to consider is remember how the, 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 there was a drain that was tagging the sciatic nerve just by virtue of it being open to the wind, basically, we already know that there's probably damage to the sciatic nerve. So we already probably have weakness in the limb. One of the best ways for us to figure out what nerves and muscles might be involved in that kind of injury is to do what's called an EMG. And if you do pm &R in your training, you learn how to do EMGs. And um, usually with EMGs, um, the patient has to be awake and um, able to cooperate, but he obviously couldn't do that. He was intubated and sedated. So we had to do EMGs in the ICU, which is certainly suboptimal in somebody who is, uh, who is sedated and couldn't cooperate with the examination. That being said, we were able to determine that not only was his right sciatic nerve significantly involved, but so was his femoral nerve at the anterior aspect, uh, which controlled the, his uh, uh, anterior aspect of his legs or his, uh, like his uh, quads. So we figured from that study, at the very least, if we did not amputate, that he would probably need a brace called a KAFO or knee ankle foot orthoses that came all the way up to his hip um, if they were able to um, salvage um, that uh, limb. The problem with that is, remember what his buttocks look like in the picture? If we had a KAFO like this, we would really need something really good around his buttock area to, to manage the pressure of a KAFO, which is why my first uh, gut feeling was not so much the walking part, but really uh, what is the status of his buttock region and his ability to sit. Further, the other thing here, so here's what a, the KAFO would have to push up against up in this area if he had um, a, uh, a KAFO. Now, if he had an amputation, so basically taking either about probably about this much or this much, he, we, we would need to have him um, have a skin integrity that was good enough to sit down in this area. So if we did an amputation, we'd have to have some really nice tissue to cover this particular area. Finally, Remember we were talking about energy expenditure? The energy expenditure, expenditure for somebody who had a hemipelvectomy is super high. It's like jogging um, if you're gonna walk. So really we find that most people when they have to expend that amount of energy would just prefer for efficiency and function to use a wheelchair than to use a prosthesis. And in those cases, we really need something uh, with good in, uh, skin integrity at the buttock region. Um, to be able to sit uh, pretty much full time on their bottoms. So in this particular case, he did um, move on <clears throat> to have a, uh, a hemipelvectomy. And this kind of looks strange, but this was a graft and a, a flip up of tissue. They basically took this tissue, whoops, and flipped it over to fill in this big soft tissue deficit. And um, basically he, here he is, this is a better picture of it. He's being fitted here for a hip disarticulation prosthesis. And you can see then how important it was, not so much about fracture healing or about walking, but it was really about the buttock integrity that was gonna be important for him. And remember how I said that it takes a lot of energy for somebody to ambulate? 
Um, that is borne out here because where did I find his prosthesis? I found it in his closet because really for the most part, it's way more efficient for him to ambulate um, here with a, um, uh, to, or to mobilize with a wheelchair. I'm gonna skip down a little bit here. Talk, uh, just talk really quickly about some cool things we're doing in our department. And that is on very special cases uh, for prosthetics, we are actually connecting the prostheses directly into the femur in, the, in that case. Um, which is called osseo integration. We're basically integrating the prosthesis into the um, uh, bone itself because this provides great feedback for um, for gait um, to have the patient really know where their where their limb and their knee is in space. And I think here's an example. This was given to me by whoops, the developer of this technology or the pioneer of this technology. Let's see if I can, I can't get it going. It was a second ago. Oh, hold up, wait for it. Nope, can't seem to get it going. Suffice it to say he climbed, he climbed up the climbing wall. Okay, there are, however, let me just show you this picture um, if I can get it. Let's see. I don't know if you guys are gonna see this technologies that are making, hold on, I'm gonna turn the voice off here. Can you guys see this? I think you have to reshare your screen. Today. Okay, I have a feeling too. Hold on a sec. Hope I can get it. Um, 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 um. Hold on, let me, uh, hopefully, whoops, no, that's not it. Hold on, okay. I'm going to just do the desktop because that'll hopefully get this. Uh, okay, do you guys see that? Yes. Okay, so this is somebody who's walking with a conventional prosthesis. Hold on, wait for it, hold on. Now I'm going to show you somebody who's walking with a myoelectric Pro, uh, not a myoelectric with a um, with a C leg. Hold on a sec. Let me get out of this. Hold on. Can you guys see? Can you guys see? Still see? Yeah, I think the second one it doesn't look like it's hyperlinked. So okay. Hold on. I'm gonna try to do this real quick. This is basically a microprocessor knee. It's computerized and uh, programmed uh, to help control the knee so that you can achieve ambulation like this. Suffice it to say with the regular prosthesis, you can't walk with this type of gait. Um, you would buckle, the knee, the knee would definitely not let you do this. This basically helps provide resistance from the knee buckling um, to uh, prevent the knee from uh, giving way when, when it's least expected. So there's a lot of really cool technology that's coming out and more becoming more and more available uh, to improve uh, ambulation for those who would other not, otherwise not be able to uh, uh, ambulate or run in this manner. Leaving you guys only two seconds for questions. Sorry about that. But anybody have any questions? One question I have from uh, earlier, I remember you showed us a video with um, somebody who had a dip in his gait. Yeah. And I was wondering, is the reason that you wanted to correct that gait because what his abnormal gait would then cause some like secondary muscular or um, bone loading problems? That's a really great question. So one of the, one of the reasons why we like to um, get the gait as, as good looking as possible is is that, you know, that whole adage, your hip bones connected to your knee bone and all that kind of stuff. It's true that any kind of deviations of your gait can either result in decreased efficiency or increased energy expenditure with ambulation, or it can affect adjacent or, or near adjacent joints. So problems with your knee can result in problems with your hip mechanics, 
which can then result in problems with your low back mechanics. So we, um, that extra movement, maybe over the short term, uh, won't have any effect in general, but all that extra movement with his pelvis and his trunk over time may or may not result in um, back pain or potentially hip pain or even degener uh, degeneration of uh, the joints over, over a longer period of time. It's not for sure, but that's one of the reasons why we try to, um, to uh, make the gait as smooth as possible. And then also again, for energy expenditure, all that extra movement and swaying uh, is, is, uh, is costing more energy with ambulation and making ambulation less efficient. So that's a really good question. Thank you. Other stuff, Casey? Anything else since we're out of time? Okay. I do have just a quick question. And um, of course, anyone should feel free to sign off if you need to get to your one o'clock, whatever. Um, and we won't be meeting next week. There's been a scheduling change, but we will be resuming the next week on March 10th. So thanks again, everyone. Um, but yes, Dr. Pasquale, I guess my question is, sort of in terms of patients um, adjusting their mindset, I guess, to uh, adapting to limb loss. I was just wondering if you could touch on that and, and what you've noticed in talking to your patients and how you work that into part of the limb loss sort of evaluation or the way that's wrapped in to how, how team-centered um, the patient care is and how that finds its way into sort of the clinic visits in terms of patients adapting in different ways or sort of psychologically to the, the big change in their body. That's uh, all good questions. And it's, it's a challenge because in clinic, um, especially I've been to clinic here at the general there, or, or any other place, um, you're so limited in the time that's available um, to interact with the patient. So we do our best to try to figure out, to ask the right, uh, well, what we hope are the right questions, like how are you doing at home? Are you getting, how are you getting in and out of the bathroom to make sure they're at least access, are, are able to access some you know, vital, vital things like the kitchen or the bathroom. Can they get in and out of their house? And then sometimes that brings up other stuff like um, they don't have in-home support services or they don't have, um, um, uh, an IHSS person, which is like a caregiver person coming in, um, by asking those questions, we can uh, then reach out to our social worker colleagues to say, hey, Mr. Jones doesn't have, does he qualify for X, Y, or Z? In terms of sort of the psychological um, adaptation to or adjustment reaction that can occur, um, we hope to try to touch, uh, touch on that by having our support group uh, which meets monthly. So we have some more experienced uh, amputees who have some of which have gone through peer training um, to try to be available for particular patients uh, during that time. Um, we find that um, our, the, or the prosthetist has a long standing relationship with all of the patients because they're sort of their prosthetist for life or at least the, the members of the office are. So they have a much better idea of what somebody else is doing. And also what it turns out it was sort of serendipitous when we have our FLS clinic, the other concurrent clinics that are happening at the same time is podiatry, perfect, because they often have a longstanding relationship with the patient. Plastic surgery, again, and then vascular surgery and as well as ortho surgery. For some reason, it all fell into place. We we're all meeting at the same time. Um, so we can walk across the hall or they can walk across the hall to us and say so-and-so is having problems, things like that. So we can do the medical part. The hard part always is going to be the psychological part. And what we can offer them now mostly is peer support um, and trying to ask, ask the questions that uh, would have most to bear with their day-to-day -day activities um, and achieving their ADLs or their, uh, or their instrumental ADLs. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, Dose, is that it? I think that is, yeah. Thanks again for um, being willing to join us for the elective. Um, and I, yeah, I guess, I mean, we're out of time, but. Yeah.